that means it's yeah. Uh, so. Okay, sweet. So uh, thank you, Joey, for joining us today on our Fresh Perspectives call. Um, for those of you that are unacquainted with the format, the basic idea is we try to get together with a mentor or a stakeholder within our community to uh, really just kind of discuss, you know, what got us to the, what got you to this point in your career, what you've learned, uh, and ideally maybe a little touch on the current environment as it is, uh, whatever's going on, and just kind of things that you think would be important for entrepreneurs to understand. And so. Uh, I'm really excited to have you. Uh, you've been one of our biggest champions since we opened. Um, you've been a, a very strong voice within our community, uh, always providing you, you know really great personal perspective. And I know you've had some ups and downs uh, in your own career, which uh, have really influenced everything that's going on. And hey, look at you today. You're a, you know celebrated. Uh, did you make tenure for a And M yet, or well, tenure so, track? Or so yeah. So basically. Um... I was able to avoid tenure track and got the full promotion at the same time. So I'm what I'm like a, you can kind of think of me as like the Matthew McConaughey, right? <laughs> of A&M, because I have the exact same title as him. I'm a, uh, an associate professor of the practice and he has the same title. So that means wow. that instead of being a scholar of the field, I'm a professional of the field. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, I mean, that's super exciting. I mean, I, I yeah, know that. Yeah, no, it's uh, huge. I got a six-year uh, promotion in six months. Wow. Which is yeah. like basically unheard of. So. I, was, I mean, I, I'm super stoked for your your continued journey, and you know what I love about everything that you've done for the San Antonio community at large is that the students that you have kind of taken under your wing tangibly are out in the community. I think I've seen more entrepreneurs in San Antonio at a younger age from classes uh, that you've you know, le led. And I just find that extremely inspiring because there's really not, uh, from my perspective as a call it younger person in the world, uh, it's harder to find those young entrepreneurs and somehow you are molding them. Yeah, I think you know one of the things that made a difference was that um, you know, a lot of the students that I had really were just from San Antonio. They were they were going to be uh, students that were going to go work for USAA or Whataburger and have a, you know, three, two house with two kids and 1.5 dogs or whatever. And instead, like when I would bring them in, I would say, hey, look, this is the trajectory that everybody has uh, possible to them in terms of going to go get that. But have you thought about this? You know, have you thought about what it's like to also maybe own your own business or strike out on your own or at least do some consulting so that you can know, yes, that's a great option. And that's an option that a lot of people take and I'm not knocking it, but I just want you to know the full, full array of possibilities um, for employment and then business ownership. Yeah, I dig it. So um, I, like I guess it's starting sort of at the front end of your life journey to be where you are. You're also a business owner. Um, yeah. You sell, or rather, you uh, yeah, I guess you sell high five yeah. equipment. Um, it's like super awesome. I've been to your spot on the on the west side, Druminoids, and honestly, I'm I'm just super inspired by number one, your love of sound. I think that's incredible because I love music too. Um, and I think the first time I ever really get to experience that high quality feel was sitting on, on the couch in Dreaminoids and, yeah. and getting that Riga sense. And, and then also you sharing with me that backstory of Riga. Um, right. You've um, been a leader on sort of the digital media space in San Antonio, helping instigate uh, a number of conferences locally. Um, and then again, you, you've helped form a number of mine. So really, I guess, you know, what destined you for the space that you're in? I mean, you're an entrepreneur in one sense, right. and then you're also an educator in another sense. And then you're also just an avid media person, right? And then also a car aficionado. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I guess my overall, um, Thing in life is helping others. That's the name of my YouTube channel. If you type in Joey PhD, helping others, that's what comes up. And um, I interview people on an array of different topics. I then also cover some of the things that I'm interested in life. And, um, you know, one time when I was having a really hard time at my job at UIW, my dean pulled me into 
her office and like was scolding me and, and wanted to like get me to quit. And, uh, <laughs> and she was like, so what do you really want to do in life? And I was like, help other people. And she was like, I know we all want to help other people, but like, really like what drives you? Like, what do you really want to do in life? And I was like, I want to help other people. And she was just like, didn't understand that like people say that to be nice. They say that to look like, you know, I mean, of course you want to help other people. Right. And it's like, no, like I take this to the last nth of the mile. Like I'm going to, I'm going to go and I'm going to help you. And, um, and so I, I take it to a point that mo that it's uncomfortable for most people um, that are are being fake uh, to the point that you know most people that say that they uh, they're saying that because of course you've got to say that I'm at a Christian serving institution at the University of Incarnate Word I mean of course you want to help other people well you know I think uh, some of y'all may not know this that are in interns but one of my best students was shot and killed by that university. And uh, and that's when I stuck up for helping other people and and spoke up and really stood up for that student and his family and the students that I took to their funeral where my dean and other people ghosted, you know, were these people that say they had uh, they believe in helping others. I was like, no, like, I don't just believe in it. That's what I do. And so uh, you might be like, wow, this is a really crazy conversation, Joey. I'm like, yeah, I'm a little crazy, but roll with me here. So I take that same enthusiasm for helping other people, which happens in dire situations like that. But, you know, I own a hi-fi store and I want to help you find the best hi-fi. I, 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 I want people to have a good time listening to music. If you enjoy listening to music, you should be able to come to my shop and have a great experience. And um, I'm going to educate you about hi-fi, but you're also going to educate me. You're going to educate me about who you are and like music that I don't know anything about that you're into. And um, like some people will talk about their, uh, I saw on a post the other day, someone was looking to give records to somebody and, and this like audiophile, I'm not a big fan of audiophiles. I uh, just see, so you know, they're, they're people that listen to either equipment or have very confined ways of listening to their music. And one of the things that uh, bothers me about them is exactly what they wrote in this post, which was, oh, well, you know, uh, a music collection is very personal. You can't just give people music and, and, um, and think that that's what they want to hear. And I'm just kind of like, you know, in 2007, I got really into how record stores worked. And um, what I decided to do was document every single record store in Central Texas. So in San Antonio, New Braunfels, San Marcos, and Austin, I went to every single record store and I would walk in. And instead of me thinking, I need to get the next Jimi Hendrix album that's missing out of my 20 Jimi Hendrix albums that I already have, I would walk in and say, what are 20, or sorry, what are five albums that you can recommend to me to buy today? And I'll buy them. Tell me about it. And I, like that's what I want to learn because what I, what I quickly learned was that all of these different record shop owners were interested in audio and music for their own reasons. You know, they had their own purposes. Like there was one called Backspin Records and it was like these two white guys that were really into hip hop. And so they had like all this hip hop. And that's where I learned about like Dead Prez and learned about like conscious rappers and like uh, uh, Akeem and like all these different, you know, other spaces that like I just got their records and put them on. And next thing you know, I'm learning more. And then there was like DJ Dojo, which was like this other like little uh, record shop that was like EDM centric. And I was getting EDM music from them. And so by the time I was done, I had bought like $2,000 worth. And I was in school still. I had bought like $2,000 worth of records <laughs> inadvertently over a year. And I had this like a massive, huge collection. People would come over to my house and they would be like, what do you have? And I'd be like, I don't, I don't know but I have a little bit of everything. And they were like, how can you not know what's in your collection? I was like, because I kind of just told people to like, you know, tell me what to get and I get it. And I've listened to most of them, but I haven't listened to all of them. And so people would come over and they would be like, you have this, like what, you are not cool enough to have this. I'm like, I'm not. But like, I asked some people and they gave it to me. 
And now evidently this is cool. So I have it, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know, Boards of Canada back then was kind of like a band that people like, or it was like these really quiche kind of uh, uh, indie, indie albums that I would end up getting sometimes and people would look at me. But, um, but you can see that, you know, I'm not bullshitting. Like there's a sincerity level of helping other people that's like, I wanted to help promote those shops because I really did believe in small business and I've always believed in small business. And so when I made that my website, like for some of those shops, these were the only photos of their shop back in 2007, right? This was the only web presence they had because they weren't all tech savvy and Facebook and especially YouTube. They weren't super prevalent. I mean, um, MySpace was around at the time and that was probably going to be more along the lines of where we'd show up. I actually had a MySpace page for my project that I was doing, but, um, but yeah. And so that's kind of like how I got the drive to kind of start thinking about this. I've always been driven, uh, like I said, to help other people. I mean, I'm an Eagle Scout, which is cheesy, but it is what it is. And I don't drink or smoke or do drugs. Like my idea of fun is like helping people. Like today, my dad was like, you know, earlier this week, my dad was like, Hey, you have some stuff in my garage, you know, can you come look at it? And it's like, you know, I spend an hour and I like, I get this place like looking crazy. And my dad's like, wow, this looks great. I'm like, yeah, this is what he and I love to do. You know, we like to clean and stuff. So, um, I don't know. I, I, the other thing that really helped me is that, um, I'm kind of dumb. <laughs> that makes sense. So I went to UT, I got my BS, my MA, my PhD and in a top five program in the nation in radio, television, and film, specifically working in new media. But the whole time I was there, like I was basically almost failing out my whole grad, uh, undergraduate uh, degree. So when I graduated undergraduate, I had a 2.57 GPA. I mean, I was like hanging on by a thread. My first semester at UT, I got put on scholastic probation. And um, every kind of like uh, level up, somebody would tell me like, you're really not cut out for this. You should really rethink uh, why you're doing this and how you're approaching it. And I call it having like enough stupid in me. Like I had enough stupid in me to just not listen to them and just keep going and keep doing um, what it was that I was doing and especially the way I was doing it. So one of the big things about me is that you'll see, I don't have some huge like PhD Western European dialect. I just talk normally. Um, but it's not like I didn't read 1500 pages of theory per class per semester for five years straight. And that I don't know about Foucault and Marx and Engels and like all of the great theorists uh, of the 20th century, because that's what I had to read and know about. But I just don't care about exuding that. Like what I want to exude is sincerity. And I often feel like uh, professors kind of use that as a way, like that that knowledge as a way to mediate themselves and put themselves on another level. Whereas I was always someone that learned so much more from someone that took interest in what I wanted to learn as a, as a student. So I was lucky to have mentors that both in hi-fi, which is what I, you know, do as a business and in academia, I had uh, two, two hardcore mentors that just facilitated me if I had an idea like they weren't like well this is how you need to do it they were like well what do you think that means for you I'd be like oh dang like I gotta think this through I gotta figure out what I want to do so I don't know does that kind of help or yeah no that gives a lot of great perspective on um just kind of really how like your mind works and and I guess what's really inspired you and I think you know, kind of dovetailing off of that last piece, the one thing that I think is really unique about even your teaching style is that you, you in many ways, facilitate uh, for your students as well. And I think that maybe that is also like, what what is it about that medium and that method that really, I don't know if it, if it resonates with all people that you've taught or um, it just seems like it works and I, I, right. it's, it's different from everyone else. And I, I don't know why more people wouldn't use it because it really seems like it works. So I think, I think part of what scares people is that, um, we're in a very quantitative world, right? People want numbers. They want rubrics. They want to know what to do, how to do it, when to do it, and that they got an A doing it. And instead I kind of just say, what is an A? Like you want an A? Okay. Like, 
what does that even mean? Like, what does it mean that you want an A? You just signed up for my class. Like, you don't even know what we do in this class. And I don't mean that in a condescending way. I mean, it as in like, you don't know what we're doing. So how do you, like, I just know I want to make an A. I'm like, okay, well, you got an A. So what what are you going to do? Well, I mean, well, what, well, but what do I need to do to make the A? Like, is there a rubric you can give me? I'm like, no, there's no rubric. And they're like, well, but this, so then what is this, so this class? Is, so this is just like a waste of a class. And I'm like, nope. And they're like, well, how can I know I'm going to make an A? I'm like, okay, well, if you want to know you can make an A, what you can do is you can get out a piece of paper or you can open up a doc and uh, we'll make a rubric for you. And you tell me what it is that you think you need to do to make an A in my class. And then I sit down with some of the people that are like, you know, that are, are very typical, like, I got to have a 4.0. This is everything, you know, to me. And I'll sit down and work with the people that are like less willing to just try it and, and come up with the rubric with them. And it's crazy because what they don't understand that they've just done is they've, they themselves have built the course, you know. And of course, I have a, a rubric in my head, but I'm not going to give that to them. Of course, I have like everything that we're going to do, but I'm not going to give that to them. That's not the point of the class. That's not what learning is. You know, that's just regurgitation. So basically what I do in my classes is I flip things upside down. So like I'm teaching a popular uh, culture class right now. It's a hundred person course and um, I have two assignments. Your midterm is you've got to make a four minute video about one of the chapters or lectures. And then your final is you got to make a six minute video about one of your uh, one of the chapters or lectures that I give. And it needs to be about what you think about it. And it needs to be good. I love that. I, I mean, it. like, it's just it's such a refreshing. I, and, you know, I don't want to exclude anybody that has a different mindset of, of how they work. Right. But that's totally how my mind works. It's like the definition of something is what you make of it, I guess, you know, like how do you know you did good? Well, do you feel like you did good? Like, was that the best you could do? I mean, it, there's yeah. so much variability in that answer that. And I'm know. trying to get people to understand that. Are we, are we, a, are we a puppy mill here? Are we a degree mill? Do is, is it like you just do everything that's said in this thing and then, okay, you get the degree. It's like, that doesn't get you anything in real life. Right. That's not like, what will get you a job is all of your intangibles, how right. you speak to other people, can you think uh, analytically? Can you um, come up with ideas and implement them and, and show good progress? Right. right? And, and so some people might say, well, then, Joey, then that is why you need a rubric. I'm like, yes, but here's the problem with the rubric. The problem with the rubric is, is that everybody goes about the start to finish in different ways. And if I sit here and say you have to do it this way, well, that's not how everybody does it. Mm -hmm. It's just how the person that wrote the curriculum does it. And all of a sudden, I'm just producing more Joeys. I'm not producing people who think. So one of the things I think you'll, you've noticed, Ryan, and some of y'all that will get to meet some of my students that I've taught in the past or colleagues that I have, is that we're all very different. We're not, there's not just a Joey every person. It's just the, the one overarching thing is, is that we're probably usually uh, pretty flexible and um, we're not worried about the small things we're going to get through that because the other part is that um i know the key to being a genius like everybody can be a genius all you have to do is know how to ask for help that is like the key thing is to say i don't know what i'm doing and i need help if you've ever hung out with geniuses which i've had okay i work like i had this uh like I don't even know if he's a colleague or a student or just someone that showed up at UT when I was there as a teaching assistant. He had ran, run away from home. He had just turned 18. He already had an undergraduate degree in electrical engineering and in music. Okay. From the uh, uh, university of Pittsburgh. And I mean, just a genius, flat out genius. And, um, what I, what I saw him do when he ran into problems was just look it up, look it up, look it up. Like it would just like you hit a wall and you just kept hitting your head against that wall and then the wall would break. Okay. But he just had a knack for doing it constantly and over and over again and not letting that uh, uh, anxiety drive him to stopping. 
which is weird because there were other things that would like like loud noises like he would have to leave the room oh. you know but if it was like figuring out how to write a script to make some kind of sensor work with uh, a circuit you know using an arduino like he was fine with that he would he would hit his head against the wall forever you know but um but i really kind of believe that all of my students have really unique stories to tell in their own way with their quote own lived reality that's like a, a, a word that a lot of people use right now what's your lived reality and um and i think as an entrepreneur like that's what we see constantly i mean we constantly see it out of entrepreneurs is they're thinking about here's the problem in the industry or here's the problem in this field that i want to go into uh, and this is my unique take on it. And this is how I think it's going to be profitable. And it's, and, and very few times are they literally cookie cutting out of exactly what somebody else did. Yeah. I think that, I mean, that, that mindset of what you're talking about, I mean, it just sounds like the, the epitome of sort of entrepreneurship, like the ability to think through a situation. I, I, I myself also was not the greatest of students in undergrad. Uh, I have an accounting degree, but I, my actual accounting grades were like, whatever. Um, <laughs> and, you know, the the one accounting class that I, I mean, the two accounting classes I did really well in was tax research, because it was about actually going and finding the answer, which I was always really good at figuring out the answer. And the other one was managerial accounting, which was in, intuiting what something should be uh, like a, a cost within a system like trying to figure out like how much would this cost if I did this or how much, you know, what would be the profitability if these things happened? Like, because those right. are problems to solve, not just like, where do I put the debit for this particular item? That is, that's like a memorization row. And, and so much of that, uh, that t type of course and curriculum is memorization, but in the real world, life is an, life is an open book test, right? Like, right. Well, yeah. that was one of the things with starting our business. So the way my business came about was that, you know, that big thing happened at UIW where I was teaching. I knew my time was limited because, you know, <laughs> they definitely weren't uh, looking for justice for my student like I was. And um, and so even though I did a phenomenal job there, like I did such a good job there that they promoted me while they still hated me because I had done so well that it was indisputable that I deserved the, and when I say undisputable, um, like literally they had a quantitative like matrices that you had to fill out. It's a five year uh, uh, promotion. And I filled it all out and you were supposed to have 16 points and I had 88. And uh, my Dean was like, um, I feel like some of these, you know, aren't, aren't quite right. You know, I don't think all of these should count. And I said, okay, cool. Like which ones and just take them out and we'll go from there. And she was like, well, no, I'm just saying like, you know, you, this, this is a ridiculous amount. Like it's inappropriate. And I'm like, okay, well, that's what you wanted. So anyways, so I was going through like an environment like that where I, I, well, I was a good employee. I was doing what they asked me to, but I was also standing to my convictions, which caused tension. So I wasn't a great employee. I was just good. So then uh, they basically, the next year, they give you a raise based on your merit, meaning like how well you meld with the institution. And that they said, no, you don't meld. And I was like, ah, I agree with you. And so they're like, look, you have one year and pack up your stuff and you got to go. So I did that one year. I applied for a bunch of different jobs and uh, I did some on-site interviews, but nothing, nothing you know, came together. And so what I decided to do was, so for those that don't know, in academia, you apply like once a year. There's no like running open positions. You just you apply in the fall, you find out in the spring, and then you do it over again. So I had been talking to one of my students that I had taught, and um, we were joking around. And I said, man, we should open a hi-fi store. He's like, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, we should do that. And I was like, wait, what? He was like, yeah, man, that, I've got a building. He uh, he himself, I had taught him and he had a huge array of, of experience. I met him when he was like 19 or 20 and he was living in a double wide with his grandma on the south side and worked at Easy Pond at the time. He had had like 10 different jobs before that. He had lived out of his car before that. 
he had a kid. He was uh, just, I don't know, hungry. He went to Palo Alto. He had gone to Harlandale. Um, and, uh, and by the time he finished uh, going through my program, he was working for Apple Corporate in San Antonio. So he had worked at the Apple Store retail. And then uh, I had put him in contact with uh, one of my friends that worked for Apple in Austin. And he was like, hey, I can get you a job working remote for Apple in San Antonio. And so everything just worked out. But then he like decided to quit that entrepreneurially and uh, go and buy a building and open up an arcade. And so uh, the arcade had done well, but it ended up not being uh, exactly what he wanted to be doing. And so um, he changed what he wanted to do and that was right when I was leaving. And so uh, I took out my retirement and I took some of it to live off of because I knew I was gonna live for a year. And you gotta remember like at this point, I'm 35 years old, 36, 36 years old. I had just had a kid. Um, I was like facing huge humble pie because I was making $90,000 as an employee, I had just gone to zero, right? I got to take out my retirement. It was like $70,000. I had to pay the taxes out. So it was like 55. And then um, I took 15 of that and I put it into the business. And he and I, uh, I worked, you know, one of my friends that I went to UT with went on to go get his CPA from UT and then also go get his law degree from NYU. And he happened to be in San Antonio. And so he helped us get everything, uh, you know, locked down for uh, filing an LLC together and making sure we had everything right for our business. And, um, and there we were, we went, I, I knew a distributor that sold the brand that like I love that I've loved since I was 16. Uh, it's called Riga. It's a uh, handmade in, um, Essex, London, sorry, Essex, Essex, uh, uh, United Kingdom right next to London. And, uh, and that's really unique because most places design something and then build it in China. You know, this is like design and made in house and they sell turntables that started like 475 and go all the way up to $45,000. And, um, when I was 16, I learned about hi-fi. I worked all summer, earned money and bought one. And, um, and ever since then, that was something I had done. Like even while I was doing my, my BS, my MA, my PhD, I started working at a hi-fi store in San Antonio called Concert Sound. They came up to Austin to, to visit me and were like, we want to move to Austin. So they moved to Austin. And then after a while, they were like, we're really staying here. So they changed their name to Austin Hi-Fi. And uh, we turned into an importing business and we started importing equipment from Germany, uh, Switzerland, and um, in the UK, or, or yeah, the UK, Scotland. And, um, and so I was having like manufacturers come and stay at my place and just learning about this whole world. And so by the time my, my business part, my current business partner, Christian Rios said that he wanted to, uh, he would, he was in on starting this business. I was like, yeah, well, let me get a hold of all my contacts and we'll get this set up. And that's what we did. We picked up Riga and, um, we had, we came up with a five to 10 year plan. So we knew that our business wasn't going to be profitable for at least five to 10 years. We knew that we were going to have to put money into it and build it. And um, the other thing we decided was that, which this is really different. Um, so we kind of, you know, not kind of, we went with the bootstrap model, right? So uh, I was run at the time I was just running the shop and I was using my savings up, but I was still applying for jobs. I applied that year I applied for 42 different jobs and I had about five full on-site interviews. Um, and uh, what we committed to was only using cash. So no small business loans. Like we went to SSFCU to open up our checking account and our bank account. And Christian and I, you know, I had, spent $150,000 on my, on my uh, student loans. My wife had spent about the same. So I have a huge student loan debt. I basically own a house of knowledge with my wife. And um, I had some credit card debt from college. And I had to turn, you know, I turned those into personal loans so I could just pay them all off. And so I was on a trajectory to like have less debt, but I, I still had a lot of debt, but I had a great credit score, you know, like in the, 700s 
Um, and so did my business partners. So we walk into SSFCU, we would say we want to open up a business savings and, and, uh, and checking account. And they're like, oh, you qualify for $100,000 in small business loans. And we were like, yeah, no, we're good. And they're like, no, seriously, like you can just get this money. And we're like, nah, like we're not, <laughs> we're not doing that. Like we don't, we don't, that's, we got, we started our business to get out of our bad practices, to get out of that anxiety of being in debt all the time and not doing what we love. Like this is going to be our, our, our refuge. I think that's the word. Yeah. Or where we want to go and be happy and love what we're doing. Like we're not selling toilets. We're not selling uh, uh, commodities that like you have to have. Anybody that walks into our shop should be happy to come and buy this. Like it's not, a, it's not like, oh man, like I guess I'll take it because I have to have a $10,000 hi-fi, you know? <sighs> It's like, I mean, every once in a while you get people like that and you're just kind of like, these people are so privileged. It's not even funny yeah. for to be able to have that kind of mentality. I'm like, no. Uh, and, and, and honestly, that's like 1% of our customers. Like uh, all of our customers are awesome. But um, but yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's, we started off that way. And, you know, the first year was like half a year and we did a couple thousand dollars in sales and we were like, all right. And then the second year, we did much better, you know, we made tens of thousands of dollars. And then this is our third year. And before COVID, we had made more in the first three months than we made all of last year. Wow. Yeah, That's like pretty stellar. Were bonkers. And since then we've, we've been making as much or more than we were making last year per month, if that makes sense. Oh, that's awesome. Like, so even with COVID happening, uh, we're still making sales. Our, the other thing that we do is that my business partner uh, is a social media specialist. And uh, and there's a, I want to be clear, like he doesn't label himself as such. He just is one. Okay. So uh, uh, it's really interesting because back in like 20, man, what's this, like 2012? He told me, he was like, I have the best barber in the world. And I was like, uh-huh, that's cool. And he's all like, no, like, I want to go shoot a video of him. And I was like, whatever. He was a student of mine at the time. And uh, and so I said, cool, man, go do it. And uh, so he goes and shoots this video. And it's this uh, barber named Rob the Original. And he does, like, this fade of, like, I think it was Tony Parker or uh, Johnny Manziel. I can't remember which one came first. I think it was Tony Parker. It ends up going viral. It's on, like, World Star Hip Hop. It's on this. It's on that. Um, and this guy just he blows him up. He totally blows him up. He, uh, Christian ends up flying out to Las Vegas with him, uh, getting hooked up with Babylus pro, which is like a subsidiary of con air, which makes wow. like hair dryers and trimmers. And so this guy has his own line ends up blowing up on, on Instagram. He has over a million followers. And so, um, so our approach to our business was, you know, coming back to small business was like, okay, like, we want to build up an authentic brand and an authentic following. And we know that we don't need everybody to come to our store. We just need people that want to come to our store, come to our store, which is very different than how most small businesses are thinking. They're like, if I could just get 500 people to come in here. Maybe I'd be able to grab one. I'm like, I don't have time for 500 people to show up. And I don't, that's just not what we're doing. I want maybe five people a week showing up. And to just, cause that's what we can manage. That's what we can handle. I'll be able to give them my time, help them out. And so what we did was we just started very, very uh, 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 content rich, but uh, not super spread, like not a wide cast, but like a narrow cast social media campaign. And that's what we've been doing since. So we're on Instagram. We maybe have a couple hundred followers, but our tags uh, and, our, and our posts hit the right people. You know, uh, we ha on YouTube, we have a couple hundred subscribers, but our videos have thousands of views because like our tags hit the right people. And we just, we make some content and then we see how it does. And then we go back and that's what we've been doing ever since. And uh, like last week we released a, a video about some amplifiers and uh, it was a 20 minute video. I was like, man, I don't know how people are going to do with this. 
it did super well. It's got thousands of views. Wow. And um, the manufacturer like subscribed to us and wow. uh, sent an email to the distributor thanking them for having us as dealers. And that, you know, they really like what we're doing. And I already, and I've already shot like four more videos that go in line with this video. Um, so it's one of those things where like my objective isn't so much, I'm not, it's weird. Cause since we have a five to 10 year plan and we're doing this all cash, it's like my objective is to win over the manufacturer, win over our distributor and have business flow from authentic people that want to buy. Mm-hmm. Cause that's so much more efficient than saying we're having a Memorial day sale and we're offering 20% <laughs> off. Come on down to dream annoyed tie fi and having all these people come down and going like, I want 20% off, but I don't even know what you do. What is it? And me having to sit there and go through all of this showmanship or show personship and win people over because that's just really inefficient to me. Um, it's nice to be able to put content out and have people contact you and be like, oh, I saw you. You have this and that. Like, I'd like for you to drop ship it to me. Um, that would be awesome. And I'm like, OK, let's do it. Or I want to come by and check this out. And before COVID, we were running our shop Friday through Sunday, 12 to 5, which is really unique because um, most shops would think that they need to be open Monday through Friday. But in the high fry world, like most people are working, (laughs) you know, like you have to work to buy this stuff or you can be retired. Right. But most people are are working a lot. So it's like there's no reason for them to be needing to go to the high fi store at 10 a.m. on a Monday or Tuesday or even at a 3 p.m. on a on a on a Thursday. Right. So um, so Monday through Sunday works really well because especially Sunday because people are like, wow, you're open on Sunday. I'm like, yeah, like you just come on by 12 five. And like, I mean, I have people lined up now, but before uh, COVID, that's how we were open. Now we're we're uh, by appointment. Right. Because wow. basically my concern is I just want people to feel safe coming in. Um, that there's not going to be some random people walking in, breathing all over the place, that kind of stuff. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's basically what we've been doing. And then when COVID happened, we just went full tilt on our social media. And my business partner, um, he, had, he, he and his girlfriend are police officers. Wow. And, um, and so Christian is a, is, is a police officer. And he has an Instagram account. I think it's like Texas Cop. And uh, it has about six or 700 followers. And so I guess about a month and a half ago, he, you know, he was talking with his girlfriend and his girlfriend was like, yeah, I'd love to do an Instagram channel. And he was like, okay, well, let's, let's do it. And she was like, I don't even know what that means, but okay. And so he screen capped, uh, you know, her Instagram and it was like 296 followers. And I think right now they're at like 11,700 or something like that. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And it's all authentic. It's not bought. And uh, we're learning a lot about how the uh, uh, algorithms work for in terms of authentic engagement versus bought engagement and looking at the ratio of likes versus how many followers you have and um, how businesses like it's like, yeah, you can get likes uh, as a business page buying you know, sponsored, uh, 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 ads, but you're going to have to do that forever. Right. And then, um, if you, if you keep a personal page, like there's, there's some benefits to that. You know, one of the things about getting over 10,000, uh, Instagram, uh, followers is that you can then start posting links to things in your posts. And there's like other kind of perks, but there's also trade-offs to it. And you have to kind of figure out where you fall and, and how you fit as a small business into these spaces, because uh, it may be more beneficial to just stay as a personal page. You know, um, it just depends on what you're doing. Like if you're a business on a, on a social media platform and you say that you are a business, then um, you, they are going to treat you like a business. <laughs> and they're gonna want everything paid for. Um, and so that's a really interesting kind of thing to think about when you're a small business trying to get your name out there is that maybe it's not always necessary to uh, start off that way, especially if your business really isn't that much of a business yet. Does that right. make sense? No, that makes, that makes a ton of sense. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that I want to kind of go back to, uh, you know, this whole transition into 
you know, I guess, you know, starting the hi-fi shop and everything. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I feel like I don't hear, but I, I, I'm assuming existed is I don't, I don't hear a lot of fear in, in your voice or, or, you know, well, I don't even hear regret in your voice, which I think is a positive thing, but <laughs> like, were you, were you scared? I mean, are you still scared? I mean, is it, it like, yeah. how do you justify yeah. So what I, basically what I learned was, is that what brings fear to us, at least to me, and because I suffer from anxiety, like I have huge anxiety attacks. Uh, I, you know, I take medication for it as needed. I take Xanax if I have a really bad anxiety attack. So, I mean, don't get me wrong. <laughs> there are things that make me anxious. But the reason you hear me so uh, happy about this is that I think the biggest anxieties for me, and I'm realizing this as I get more and more out of debt, is debt. You know, I was just, I was always scared of, excuse my French, fucking up the financials. I was always scared, like, man, I'm in debt. I don't manage money well. I don't know how to, and having a business run on cash and having a business partner that we hold each other accountable. And I, you know, I do a, a, a P&L every year. And this month, year, I've been doing it every month um with with my dad who's a, a former accountant um it just makes you it, it really makes you see everything that goes in and out like there's just no way to avoid it you know you can't you can't hide what you're doing uh if you're <laughs> if you're being artist right uh with yourself and so so actually opening the business and doing this business uh with my business partner just like it actually brought all my anxiety so much lower because we were having success and our overhead is low to the point that um, it it's made it so that that is not even something that concerns us. The other side that really helped and you know, and, and I'll admit this is that I did get, end up getting a job, right? Uh, I got this job at A&M as a lecturer, which just means like I teach four classes and that's it. I, I teach and I go home. So I bought like, or not bought, I, I, I leased out like this really crappy apartment. I had a drug dealer next to me. It was uh, an efficiency. So it didn't even have, you know, had a door and then that was it. Like you just, there was a bathroom and, and I mean, it was falling apart. There were roach. I mean, it was gross, but that's where I lived. I lived as cheap as possible up there. And I just drove back and forth that first year. And my wife was teaching here in San Antonio. I'd run the shop on the weekends. I'd drive back up. And I just did that because we also had an apartment here. And I was making $40,000 a year, which is like not even I, – that's maybe a lot of money for some people. But for, for the level of education that I you know, invested in, that was not that much money. I was making $90,000 before, so I was making less than half. And like I said, all of a sudden – the reason I'm really relaxed these days is because, you know, I, I'm very fortunate and I lay, uh, I have articles, everything I've talked about is all online. That's the other reason why I'm so nonchalant about it. Like you can read all of this. I publish it all because I want people to know that like I'm not successful and confident because I'm perfect or because I think I know everything It's because I don't know everything and I know I can ask for help. Um, but, uh, for whatever reason, my boss like came and like five weeks into my job, I was like, I need to talk to you right now. And I had a student in my office and I was just like, what did I do? I'm just starting here at AM. Like, how am I already in trouble? And he's like, I want to talk to you. He pulls me out to the hallway and he's like, I want to talk to you. It's like, we need you here. I'm like, well, I'm here. And he's like, no, like, we need you here and we need your family here. And we like, we need, we need you. And I was like, oh, okay, I don't know what that means, but let's talk about it. He's like, we are going to talk about it. I was like, okay. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, that's when I went down the road of, of getting that huge promotion. And uh, my wife, um, we weren't able to find her a job there, but she ended up getting a job at, uh, for Brian ISD and she loves it. And it's amazing. And we live in downtown Brian in this little historic area. And it's, it's kind of like living in Dawson's Creek or any one of those Gilmore <laughs> shows or however you can imagine they have like a little small business area. And, uh, and we don't live, I don't live in a roach motel anymore. <laughs> so we live in a really nice apartment. But again, like even that it was like, I just, I realized I was like, okay, I'm making all this money now. Let's live as tight and as lean as possible. Right. Like to full, full transparency, like, this room I'm in, I'm at my sister's house right now. 
because uh, um, like, my kid wanted to see my nieces and we've all been COVID checked and we're all like been distancing and we're finally at the point that they can see each other again. Um, I mean, my wife and my kid and I lived in this room for a year. My sister just helped us out. Uh, when, when that 2018, when I was jobless, like my sister just let us live here. And, uh, and so like, I know how to take humble pie. I know how to tell people like, I'm not making any money. I'm, I, I, I'm not doing well. And I'm just going to have to put my head down and work hard. And yeah, I got to ask for help. And yeah, like I fucked up. Uh, and, and so as I turned around and I've had more income coming in, now it's like I live such a lean life. Like I was saying in that, that apartment downtown, Brian, it's like living, I don't know, in a $2,000 apartment here. But in Brian, it's $1,000. Wow. So we just live down there. I could be living in a fifteen hundred or two thousand dollar place or have bought a house. But I was like, no, we just need to live a thousand dollars and we need to leave everything. Like I buy all used cars. Like I just I really have just keep condensing and condensing things down. It's like, trust me, I live a nice life. I'm having a lot of fun, but I I've now made it so that instead of having a lot of overhead, I have a lot of overhead savings that I'm able to just put into the bank and put into the bank even during COVID. Right. And, um, and so that's why I'm so relaxed is that uh, I'm slowly being able to position myself. And I think that's one of the hardest things about college since you have interns, I assume they're going to college is yeah. that, you know, at UIW, I taught a class cause I changed the class to teach you how to like figure out how to graduate and have a job and make money and know about your, you're, how you're going to pay for everything so that you're not freaked out and scared. But at big institutions, they just don't do that. When I went to UT, you just, you know, you took classes and then one semester you were done. And that was it. It wasn't like you took some class and they were like, hey, uh, how are you, you, do you know what your loan payment is going to be on your student loans? <laughs> you know, like what you're going to do about living in car? Do you know how to go and apply for a job? Do you know how to, do you know that it's okay to have applied for 200 jobs and only get five calls? and only get one interview and maybe get that interview? Did you know that that's just how life is sometimes and that there's nothing wrong with you and that you're okay? Like, they don't tell you that part, you know? They're just kind of like, congratulations, go find a job. And uh, and I've seen people like that um, that have persevered in ways that I just, I saw, all I saw was this trajectory. You know, a really great example of that is one of my students, Andrew Valdez. You know, he took a graduate level social media class with me. He ended up getting a job at Palo Alto and he worked there for a long time. And then um, he ended up getting a new media director position at uh, Shriner University. And then he ended up getting coming back to, uh, to, to uh, Alamo Colleges and now is like the media coordinator for all of Alamo Colleges for the whole district. And if you just saw that, it looks like this, but then I talked to him, I'm like, oh, man, did you even do so well? He's like, man, I've, I've put in like 300 different applications. Because I, I, I interviewed at Taco Cabana, I interviewed here, I interviewed there, and it was like I was just trying to figure out what I wanted to do and trying to f see what makes sense for my, my wife and I, and we're having a kid and this and that. And, and you realize that a lot of the people that, you know, you think just have their shit together or have it all together, they're, it's, it's because they're, they're getting told no a lot. Yeah. And they're refining that. And for me, it, me as someone with anxiety, I didn't understand that when I was young. I didn't understand that 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 was the way that's not like the exception, you know, that. Um, and then the other thing is, is that for the past 10 years, job market has just been tough and it's only tougher now. I mean, what do I tell my students that are graduating and this, that graduated this spring? I'm like, go find a job. It's like, whew, it's kind of condescending since I have one. Right? Yeah. It's like it's a lot easier said than done. And well, I mean, I, and I, at the I totally graduate level, you know, I totally see what you're saying. I mean, like uh, I remember graduating, and you know, my my parents are like, "Hey, you know, you should really go and and uh, do something that makes good money." And like, you know, they're giving you the traditional, you know, parental you know kind of viewpoints that that probably made sense when they were younger. You know, like be right. the doctor, be the lawyer, go get your CPA. And, and you're like, you know, it's just not really that easy. Like, you know, I don't know what kind of jobs you think are just falling off trees, but 
that it just doesn't yeah. exist. You know, like I'm, I'm putting in time. I'm, I'm trying to build something from the ground up. And yeah, that doesn't look like it's all that sexy right now. But if stuff works out, maybe there's something there, right? And I get, you know, at yeah. some level, this is sort of the life I have to live, and I have to be comfortable with this, the decisions I make. But yeah, there's, there's so I think you know the world in, in sort of the same way that startup culture has been uh, overly. I don't know, fantasized, I guess you could say, like Silicon Valley is a show. Right. Um, that, you know, people start to believe that like, oh, I guess if I haven't made a million dollars by 30, I'm a <laughs> failure. And it's well, like. I guess yeah, I, I can interject real. here for a second, which is that um, I lived all of that. And, uh, and that was crazy. I don't talk, I guess I haven't really talked about it. I don't know if I've talked about it with you much. But I mean, I lived in Austin for 10 years, right? I got my BS, my MMA, my PhD. And I was there when Twitter, you know, launched. Uh, I have friends that wrote open source software and developed hardware and wrote closed source uh, software and wrote protocols like BitTorrent. And so I had friends when I was 25 to 30 years old that were going and becoming millionaires, like multimillionaires, going out to San Francisco and in Austin, um you could do that you could go to like i could go to a, we were talking about cars you mentioned me about cars like i could i could go to a porsche dealership at 25 and be like i want to drive that car and see what it's like and they'd be like here are the keys just listen to what you think you know? yeah, that's <laughs> so crazy. Say, and when i would do that here say i tell would be like yeah no nah, like that car that car can't be test driven you just either <laughs> buy it or you don't <laughs> and uh and i and i was surrounded by geniuses that were getting to go and do these things and start these things. I had just, uh, I participated in same style talks we're having today, but with people at the, uh, that were in Austin at that time, just, it was very limitless as to what could be done. And, uh, the VC that was there was, I mean, we could talk to them. We had access to them. We had, we saw them multiple times a year at functions. And it wasn't like, uh, oh, they're over there, and then the kids are over there. It was like, it was totally this, this, you know, intermingling. Like I'll never forget meeting Basil from Austin Ventures multiple times and talking to him, and talking to just you know different investors. And it wasn't, it wasn't like it is here. I mean, I think one thing you know, Ryan, is I've always given San Antonio a hard time because I feel like we have a caste system. Yeah. I feel like you know, there's like this ivory tower in, in entrepreneurship where you have geekdom and it's like, oh, you're geekdom, bro. Are you geekdom, you know, person or are you tech blog person? Or are you this? Or are you that? Launch SA. Um, not that Launch SA has, has any clicky thing going on, but like people just don't don't know that y'all are so open. You know, a lot of times I think people forget that. Uh, and y'all have been here for a long time. Um, but anyways, I digress. And so when I was in Austin, I really could come up with an idea and I could go pitch it, which I did. You know, I, I worked with a friend of mine. We came up with an idea. We went and talked to Trellis, this guy named John Long, who I'd met through Hi-Fi. Uh, he had, was one of the first investors in Dell. Pitched him our idea. He loved it. He was like, we would probably get two to three million dollars in, in funding. My my friend that I was doing this with decided, nah, I don't want to do it that way. And I was like, all right. I mean, okay. You know, he was just like, all right. He was like, so. You're okay with that? I'm like, yeah. I mean, I don't know. you can't go start a business if you, if, <laughs> if we're not seeing eye to eye, even though they've told us they'll give us this money. And, and he was just like, oh, okay. So, uh, and my friend now, he runs a, uh, he's, because basically what, what was with up with him was that he ha has like really huge ethical views on uh, digital civil, uh, civil liberties. And so he ended up starting a nonprofit that works on decentralized and, uh, uh, and anonymity uh, devices and software. And so he gets funding from like Google and Onion Networks that does Tor uh, and develops um, uh, all kinds of solutions for all kinds of different people, whether it's journalists in Iran or in Mexico that are trying to communicate but not have their information doxxed if they find their phone or something like that to bad people that may right. wanna, you know, hurt them. And so, uh, so yeah, I was like, I was basically from the program I did at, at, at UT, our motto was make stuff, take risks and be awesome. So I just took that when I came to San Antonio and, and implemented it. But when I was there, like 
I was surrounded by all kinds of people. I had a, I had a student that came into my class that I was, you know, teaching assistant with my professor, Sandy Stone. And um, he's like, I'm a stunt person. And we were like, okay. And he's like, they call me the Asian cowboy. <laughs> like, all right. <laughs> and so he gets up on this table and he just falls on his face. And then he just gets up and he falls on his back. And then he gets up and he just falls off the table. And he's like, I'm a stunt man. And we're like, all right. He's like, yeah, I work at Six Flags in, in Dallas and I do the rodeo show, the, the cowboy show. And he's, he really is like this Asian guy. And so what did I do with him? Well, like one semester he was like, so they're doing away with the cowboy show. It says it costs too much. And, uh, but I still want to work there, but they said I'd have to like pitch, you know, a show. And so I want to do a, a, he's Vietnamese. He was like, I want to do a Chinese lion dance show there. And I was like, all okay. right. And so we just sat there for six weeks uh, straight during office hours. And we just, I didn't know it at the time, but we just came up with a full business plan. We got, got all the expenses together, all the personnel required, you know, uh, insurance, everything, figured out what made sense, what would be viable in terms of payment. And then he pitched it to him and they took it and that's what he did. And now he's a professional stuntman in Hollywood and wow. doing videos for flow rider and on America's deadliest warriors. And, you know, a thousand ways to die and all kinds of shows. And that's what he does. So it was like, I really wasn't, I guess my point is, is that in the real world, all of this cookie cutter rubric stuff that they're having you do just, at that, I mean, I just, I mean, I know there are jobs that require that, but that's not what a college degree is for, in my opinion. And I want you all, and I want anybody who's like listening to this to just feel empowered to go and do things that matter to them and uh and yes it's harder in terms of like that effort but the rewards are just huge i mean they're just they're like in terms of anxiety and, and all of all of those things they give you a sense of control so i don't know is that helpful no that's i think that's uh honestly this is like incredibly enlightening and i i just i really have enjoyed the the conversation as a whole and and i'd really love to maybe invite you back at some point and, and kind of carry it forward and talk more. Oh, yeah. I mean, you have, you, it's like you've lived like seven lives. Well, and that's one <laughs> thing I did do is I, I do a lot of things in parallel, right? Yeah. Like one of the things, uh, if you follow me on Instagram, Joey Hi-Fi, like I, because of COVID, I'm staying out of friends and um, she just happened to have, <laughs> she happened to have this like uh, smoker for like cooking barbecue and so like for whatever reason i've like gotten really into like barbecuing right now and i've like been learning all of like the ins and outs of like that business even though i have like no interest in opening a, a barbecue uh, uh shop or a barbecue uh, uh, tr uh food truck which i have a friend that lived in austin move up to like uh connecticut or somewhere or maine and open up a texas barbecue food truck up there and he's done really well and i'm just like shocked um but uh but yeah no it's like i'm constantly i have all of these things in parallel like i got into rock tumbling with my kid and the kids that i'm with and so i've been like making little jewel sets and stuff like i just feel like you gotta go and do stuff like do the stuff that you wanted to do as a kid go buy that toy and look at it and see what made you excited about it and see like does it influence you does it uh, is it something that ends up being like this? Like, I want to design something like this. I want to go learn about 3D printers to do this. Or is it more like, I liked the the cover that it came in, the box that it came in. You're looking at the box and your, or the actual toy. Like, I just liked the play, like the, what we would call gameplay and, and game design. I just like how it plays and like that brings satisfaction to me. How would I take this and, and do something with it? You know, those are the things that are like constantly going in my head. Yeah. Like, uh, I, in my way of kind of looking at it is like experience the world. Don't let, you know, don't wait until it's too late. Yeah, for sure. You know? I, I think, you know, if you're of your, of that mindset, you know, Hey, I'm going to work till I'm 60 and then I'm going to retire and travel the world. I mean, the world right. is going to pass you by. Like you, you never, yeah. you'll never, you, who knows what'll happen in between now and then. Like, you know, if right. you're thinking, Imagine if you were thinking, you know, oh, man, one day I'm going to go to France and see, you know, the Cathedral of Notre Dame. Well, right. like now, I mean, like, <laughs> not yeah. there, you know. 
Um, and so, yeah, I just, it's kind of a seize the day in, in that in that sense. But yeah, no, I really appreciate you taking the time and sharing your insights and, and, and your journey with us for sure. I think it's sort of a non-traditional avenue to entrepreneurship in that it's not like, yeah, you know, you I mean, one day thought, hey, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. Just It, it was sort of a uh, an amalgamation of things. And I just, I, you know, the other thing, it was that, Ryan, I came to your Wednesday coffee, you know, Million Cups, and I went to Geekdom, and I went to all these places, and it was so different than Austin because what I saw happening was people taking out life savings, taking student, uh, not student loans, taking small business loans out, and then having heart attacks, basically. And the business not being fun and not being what they imagined because what they were imagining was more of a clubhouse or an experiment and they were financing it the wrong way. They were like throwing money and they were quitting their jobs prematurely in my opinion and not having real ROI schemes, not, not knowing like, yeah, I can live off of this. Not like, well, the business is making money, but I can't pay myself. It's like, okay, yeah. well, then you should have a job like I have right now where, yeah, my business is making money and I could theoretically live off of it on pennies if I also had my wife work a job. But you know what? I have a five to ten year plan, and we're slowly getting there. And and that was you know part of the process was figuring that out. You know, whereas a lot of people want to just have it go like this. It's like it's going to cost you so much more. You know, like I'm watching my friends right. I mean, I have a lot of friends having a hard time during COVID. I know we said to talk about it a little bit, but I'll just touch on it for a second. In that, like, I have two friends that own businesses that I just I um. I mean, I get tingles just thinking about them. Is uh, is Float SA with Jeremy? I think it's Jeremy Jacob is his last name. I can't remember. And, yeah, Jeremy Jacob. Yeah, and then um, Armadillo Boulders, which is owned by uh, my friend Joe Crydell and, and Michael Cano, um, which is a bouldering gym here in San Antonio. And I look at those those two businesses, and I'm thinking, I I don't know. I mean, they were doing really well going into COVID. And watching, I mean, I know they probably, all right, I know they have both had to take out the, the small business loans for both employee and, and for, for uh, additional assistance. Right. And um, it's tough because they're both two very earnest businesses that have really amazing attitudes towards helping other people. And, um, and it's just the way it is. It's just what's happening. And so, you know, I'm very fortunate in the business that we're in that we've been able to not only have business, but have good business. Um, the other business that I've seen, I will say this, the other business that I've seen really take off, my friend, now friend, because uh, I, I met him and, and we became friends, is Matt, who owns Bicycle Heaven. You know, mm -hmm. uh, bikes have done really well right now. And it's a locally owned shop. And they're fortunately, you know, knock on, on wood, they're doing okay. Uh, but it's not like that for everybody. And so that's something I've also been really conscious of as I've, I've kind of watched people post things up on, on Facebook and, and Instagram uh, about their businesses is that some people are having a really hard time and I don't, you know, don't take that for granted <laughs> that we're, we're all, that some of us are having a, a good time. I understand it's, it's not easy for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, you know, with the current environment that we're in and, you know, everything is sort of take one day at a time and just kind of be honest and real with yourself. If you're going to, if you're going to move forward, you have to really look at it with clear eyes. You know, the, yeah. the honeymoon is over in that sense. But, um, well, like I said, Joey, I really appreciate you taking the time and spend with us. Um, I know that, you know, this will be a definitely fun and, and engaging listen for, uh, those that are catching it on the back end, but, um, thank you. And I, like I said, I hope to have you again in the future. Oh, I'd love to be um, on. Just yeah. let me know. Well, I appreciate it. All right. All right. Catch you later. All right. Thank you. Thank all you, so Joey. Much. Thank you. Have Bye. Have a wonderful day. Take it easy. I'm going to go ride my bike with my kid. <laughs> awesome. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you. All right. Thanks. I'll see y'all later. All right. Okay. Bye.